Guys, welcome to a very special uh, webinar today. We've got Grant Colthrop uh, from Mind Digital. He's the CEO. Uh, Mining Store and Mind Digital have obviously made quite a nice partnership over over the coming months. Uh, and today we're putting out a video to to get the voice out there. So, Grant, do you want to give yourself a bit of an introduction? Let everyone know uh, what Mind Digital is about. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Will. Um, pleasure to be uh, doing this with you today. Uh, so I've taken I stepped into the role of CEO of Mind Digital almost two years ago now. So for a while, we were just there setting up. And then as of November uh, 2019, we've launched our uh, crypto to fiat exchange. So at the moment, that's focused upon uh, Aussie dollars and US dollar pricing on Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, uh, XRP and Litecoin. Uh, with obviously, we've got a bit of a roadmap for further product development, which we'll touch off on later in this chat. Uh, uh, so we're yeah, f uh, fully banked here in Australia. Um, we're very good, very good on our you know, liquidity, very low cost. Um, mm. Spreads are, spreads are quite good uh, on OTC as well. We're probably one of the leading, probably domestically. I think we're, we're the best or second best, certainly OTC desk in Australia. Um, and we certainly compete with the international guys on pricing. We've seen a lot of demand recently for people, obviously wanting to go back into fiat. Um, you know, to cash up a little bit. So we're, we're doing some really good business for people around, you know, Aussie dollar to Tether, Aussie dollar to USDC. And also we can do USDs as well. So if you've got a US dollar account, um, we can facilitate that. Settlement's usually pretty quick. Um, you know, depending on, on the size, we can, you know, settle within 24 to 48 hours, almost all trades. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a fairly seamless process. Um, yeah, the onboarding process is relatively simple, straightforward. So, yeah. That's really good. And I know that I've had um, feedback similar to what, exactly what you just said from some of our members. And one of them, Nev, he basically said that you, you helped him out within a, within a second with uh, getting him some US Tether um, after he put it on the exchange, uh, quite a large OTC uh, transaction as well. Um, so first of all, thanks thanks for doing that. And it's no really worries. good to hear that the, the customer service is, uh, is, is well up there. So um, on, on that note there, Grant, you I mean, obviously you would have had a massive amount of experience in, in financial markets um, before jumping into the crypto side. Um, but do you want to just tell us a little bit about your, your past experience yeah, um, sure. and also tell us how you got into um, crypto and, and how you started the exchange up? Yeah. Uh, so I finished university in 2004 uh, and I worked actually for the first year, I worked as a quantitative hedge fund manager in Brisbane. Um, so I was a pure, pure old school quant. Uh, running mainly mainly models on FX, and then I about lasted in that role for about fifteen months, and then I was offered a role with Macquarie Bank on their fixed interest mm -hmm. desk. So there was trading mainly the what's called the front end of the curve. So that's you know cash, short term bonds, short term interest rates, uh, and that was a really great experience. Obviously, one of the one of the larger desks in Australia, um, you know, and got to work with. So the the, the interesting part there was. The guys who mostly ran that desk at Macquarie at the time came from BT Australia, which BT Australia, for those who don't know, people probably think these days that that's a, it's the fund manager. But BT Australia at the time was outside the US was probably the most advanced investment bank in the world. So BT mm -hmm. Australia were the guys who did some of the first uh, interest rate swaps globally, like even against, you know, they were doing it out of Sydney to counterparts in Tokyo, in New York, in London. Uh, so it was a very, very high end investment bank. Um, the American parent blew up, which is why the Australian subsidiary got sold. So I was very lucky to work with, yeah, guys who had really been, you know, I guess at the forefront of Australian of it, yeah. Yeah, rates markets, fixed interest markets in Australia for a long time. Um, and then, uh, you know, I guess I've been very lucky. Um, 2008 hit. Um, and at that time, uh, Macquarie, obviously, as everyone know, famously know, went from about a hundred bucks to about eight dollars. So in between that, mm -hmm. I uh, I thought it was probably prudent to leave the bank, um, mm -hmm. and so I stepped out into a proprietary trading firm called PropEx Derivatives. Um, yep. So PropEx set up in Sydney two thousand and six. I joined there in two thousand and seven. Um, but the uh, the principal Max Whitby had been one of the largest futures brokers on the floor for many years. So they, they get referred to as locals. So Max was the largest local mm. on, on the Sydney Futures Exchange for many years. Um, when it went electronic, he sold most of his business to Deutsche Bank. Um, and then yep. he had a few guys who were working with him. That's how he set up <clears throat> PropEx. 
And so I stepped into there at PropEx and basically um, traded multi-asset, so equity indices, rates, and FX, uh, a little bit of commodities as well, but you know, um, but yeah, that was my, my main focus. So yeah, started there, got really lucky, started there in September 07, just as sort of the GFC was kicking off. So I got to mm. um, pretty, pretty life altering experience to trade you know at that time outside the outside of the you know great depression was the greatest financial crash of our oh, of, in history um yeah so, so got got to do that pretty much at the coal face um and then i stayed there until 20 uh, left at the end of 2012 uh to be honest just sort of burnt myself out the volatility had really started compressing so obviously 2011 was a big year with the euro crisis um, but 2012, yep. it's sort of everything had sort of gone quiet and, you know, markets had gotten really tricky. So I thought, oh, I'll just have a bit of time off. Um, and at the time I was doing a PhD part-time at University of New South Wales. So I actually, mm -hmm. I actually in 2013 went and be, uh, worked as a lecturer and a researcher for a year back at University of New South Wales. Also worked on nice. my PhD. Uh, and then 2014 came around and they had offered me a full-time lecturing role. Um, yep. And I was sort of just deciding, you know, because if you go down the academic role, you want to really stick in it for, say, five to 10 years to get the maximum benefit out of it. And yeah, I was just, sure. I just wasn't convinced that I wanted to do that. So okay. I sort of, you know, looked around for what roles were at the time. Um, and I was very lucky, IAG um, Asset Management. So IAG, for those who don't know, it's an ASX 20 listed company. Um, people don't probably know who IAG is. It basically mm. owns NRA, NRMA insurance and also owns about another 20 insurance brands across Australia. So it's actually the largest, mm. IAG is the largest insurer in Australia. It's bigger than QBE, mm. um, bigger than Suncorp. Um, so I worked in their asset management. So basically the, the crux of that is it's really simple. You, know, you pay your insurance premiums and someone's got to manage that money to make sure when you make a claim that mm. there's enough money to, to pay out all those, those claims. So sure, I, yeah, I was okay. in that in that team there, and, and mainly focused. Given my background, I mainly focused on alternative investments. So that would cover, yeah, you know, we'd we'd go off and invest in different types of hedge funds, um, different types of direct assets, so uh, direct lending, direct credit, direct property, um, and then also uh, myself and another guy were the main guys who used to uh, do a process that was very popular in the late 90s, early noughties called tactical asset allocation. Um, yep. to, to make that in plain speak for everyone, uh, you know, who might not know what that is, it's basically just market timing. So what it is, it's like, do you think equities are overvalued or undervalued versus bonds? And so yeah, then we, sure. yeah and so we'd, we'd make recommendations of, oh, well, the portfolio at the moment's 50% in equities, 50% in bonds, should we change that allocation? Um, yeah, absolutely. And you use a lot of basic, basically a lot of statistical modeling around that, around expected returns, expected volatility, expected correlation. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and then and then I guess the last part I did, really did there was given my other previous experience was I was I was pretty much the, the head of execution. So I traded most of the positions that needed to be traded in the portfolio. So whether or not that be swaps, futures, options, cash, equities. Um, FX, cash bonds, you know, pretty much I was, I was the main point guy on that with another fellow. We, we sort of shared the responsibility for that. And yep. then, and then it got to a very good friend of mine introduced me to some, some guys who have made some pretty serious investments into crypto. And that was right at the start of 2018. Um, yep. and to be honest, I'd sort of, I'd had a really good run at IAG. Um, and things were going really well there. But unfortunately, the CIO, who I'd really um, had a very good relationship with, he, he'd sort of earmarked that he was going to retire in the second half of 2018. And I'm, I just looked, sort of looked, looked at the writing on the walls like, oh, this is just not going to be the same. It's not going to be as good place to work as it was. Sure, um, sure. So, so I'd sort of started putting the feelers out over what opportunities were obviously on the, on the horizon. By that stage, I'd already been in crypto for two years. And just got super lucky. Got got this introduction yeah. to Ke so Dr. Kevin Sun, who's our main backer of, of uh, Mind Digital at the moment. I got a I got an introduction to Kevin. Um, he sort of so the guys who introduced us had sort of said, "Oh, Grant's sort of throwing around some ideas around in the crypto space. Kevin, you might be really interested in it." He's like, "Yeah, lo love to hear ideas all the time." So he said, "You know, basically put put together a pitch deck, put together a proposal, sent that over to him." And yeah, I mean, obviously we uh, we sort of mapped out the idea of what Mind Digital 
is, which obviously we've led off with an exchange so far. But I think ultimately we want to be a multifaceted, you know, um, basically a financial services company that that operates in crypto, but that oper- that offers us multiple services. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, we we sort of tied that down by September eighteen. I resigned then. Um, took a couple of months off, did some cool things like went over to New York for a week, went to LA, went to Blockchain Week in LA for a week, um, mm. did a whole bunch of other conferences in that period and then sort of pretty much really from January 2019 uh, started as full-time um, at Mind Digital. Um, and then obviously, yeah, we sort of for the first part of 19 mm. spent the time setting up, getting you know the tech ready for the exchange uh, and said we launched that in... Um, in yep. October, November 19. And then, yeah, here we are, mate. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I, other than that, yeah, I've been absolutely. financial markets, I've been trading personally, pretty much how I got into, you know, the reason why I went into a quantitative hedge fund was because, you know, third, fourth year. So I was a guy who thought doing more study was a great idea. So I did five years at undergrad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, by about fourth year, I sort of was doing night night packing at Woolies, saving away me little pennies yeah. and, and then having a punt on the <laughs> stock market. Um, yeah, in fourth yeah, year. So good. by the time I got to fifth year in honours and that, I was like, yeah, this is definitely something I'm really interested in. So, you know, freaking just turned 38. So now I've, you know, racked up pr- pretty much 20 years in markets um and i mean it comes through really clearly you know like the first time i met yourself your wealth of knowledge of all areas of the industry it's not just the crypto market you know about it's the equities market and the the amount of people that you know within the industry too um you know it's probably one of the the best things about having you in in, in the network so i mean I, i obviously um love that you know there's a lot of people that are smarts out there but they don't go to the blockchain events or they don't do presentations or sit on panels uh, and to have someone like yourself in, in the space um, who, who's quite an advocate, I guess, uh, and really wants to help people out is is a um, you know, very, very uh, good contribution to the, to the space there, Grant. So, yeah, thanks, um, No, nah, not, not a problem. So, I mean, what, what I might get you to, to run through um, now is, you know, we're, we're kind of up to where, you, where you've got to, uh, how you've got to starting up Mind Digital. Um, if you want to just tell us a little bit about uh, your experiences maybe with other exchanges uh, and, and what you wanted to change or, or, you know, what made you kind of, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a difference in this space and, and how, is, how does Mind Digital show that? Yeah, yeah. So I guess probably like a lot of guys, my early, early experience, so as I said, I sort of really got, um, became really aware of Bitcoin, I'd say, in 2011, which is the Euro crisis, but, you know, quite honestly, I think we attempted to try to buy a few bitcoins off someone in a forum and it went up five times and i remember thinking you know which we were just trading at that point like thinking well the trade's over and then forgot about it for for a number of years um i remember very early on a good friend of mine who got me really back into bitcoin in 2016 and 2013 we ran some numbers on buying a pretty big rig setup i think we we're gonna yep. i think we looked at like buying 50 grand 50 us worth of of rigs um, yeah, no. and, and the main impediment there was, was was like, I remember we went to put the down, they're like, well, you basically got to send us a, a 50% deposit and then it's a six month waiting period. <laughs> and we're like, oh, you know, they're just going to run away with your money. So we, we gave it. The early yeah. times like that, you know, yeah. you wouldn't, you, yeah. Yeah. And that was when, because we, we'd looked at it because that was been when it had the, yeah, it had that big run up, um, you know, 13, 14, where it got up to what, about $1,000 and then come all the way back to 200 and that's when we're yeah, looking yeah, at it. Sure. We're like, well, you know, payback period's a year. As long as if this thing goes back up to all-time highs, like we never thought it goes, you know, as far as it's gone, you're thinking, oh, it's still mm. that's a good investment. But, yeah, it's just unfortunately the waiting periods were too long. So as I said, yeah, we sort of really – I really gave that a miss. And then, you know, as I said, fast forward to 2016 and it was like, you know, well, you've got to get fiat money into these thing, you know, into these venues. And to be honest, I'd sort of – I'd signed up at BTC Markets. I'd signed up at IR but the limits were so small and I couldn't be bothered. I didn't want to have to ring them and especially I was still at work. So you don't want to have to ring people at work and they yeah. you talk about crypto. So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so my first one was really was I signed up to Kraken because they had still, uh, that was before they lost their US dollar swift banking. So yep. crack, Kraken at that point still had US dollars. So you could sign up and basically if you just put your passport in and you got like tier two, verification you could send them fifty thousand us a day um so i remember yeah, right, yeah. yeah so i remember i went down to cba gave them the instructions they did the swift 
And then like three days later, it's still not there. I'm like, oh fuck, that's it. Yeah, oh, and then, no. and it's it's gone. And and then yeah, like for I got CBA, like they can do their investigation. They did that, blah blah blah. And you know, lo and behold, about two days later, it went through. And then I, I sent some more test ones after that, and it was all good. And yeah, and obviously that become then my main fee at rail. So what I would yep. do is I just use um you know Oz Oz Forex. I just do a I just do a FX trade. You know, they're pretty they're pretty reasonable. Like they're forty. 40 to 50 pips, yep. um, which is not too bad, you know, about a percent. Um, yep. You know, do it Oz Forex and then just swift it over to the to Kraken. So for a long time, actually, I wasn't really even using the domestic guys at all. Um, and then when we had that big thing where the Aussie, Aussie Bitcoin was trading like 10, 12% over US dollars, obviously everyone was trying to jump on that. So yeah, that's really yeah. when I started using IR and BTC markets more. I guess the main thing that, that really came to me was, and, and uh, you know, full disclaimer, I know the, the independent reserve guys pretty well, um, is, is the fact of the matter is, and the guys say this, you know, that they've always, that, they've not really made UX updates, changes, you know, improvements because they're, they're, they are security focused is their main focus. And they're obviously very comfortable that the, the platform's secure, which it is. I mean, mm. to their credit, they've never been attacked or hacked. Um, but mm-hmm. at the same time, that's a that's a four year old UX, and mm-hmm. you know it's not and, and and it's not really on their radar to to improve that. So I, I saw it very much as the the opportunity for my digital was to come in, you know, partner with some really good technology providers. You know, uh, you know, obviously at the moment I think our UX is pretty good. When you know it's a you know it's a ne- another twelve months of of improvements are still to come. So, you know, I think for people who sign up now, look out and go, well, that's good. Well, hopefully we're going to just make it a lot better for you over the next 12 months. But that was that was a real thing, Will. It was just as simple as that, mate. I think we looked around, we looked at BTC markets, we looked at IR, you know, really competent guys doing doing a good job, but, you know, really hadn't, you know, kept pace with what, you know, Coinbase had done, what Kraken had done, you know, mm. those, those other big, or uh, Bitstamp, um, you know, what the other big feed exchanges had done, they'd sort of, you know, just, you know, not really kept up pace. So that's that's really what, what we thought. And then also I looked at it, you know, I know, again, the IR guys have changed their fees recently. Um, you know, mainly, we think mainly obviously got to do with us sort of coming into the market. But, you know, BTC markets and IR before, you know, before the guys recently changed it, you know, if you're, a sign, if you're signing up and doing very low volumes, you're paying almost a percent, you know, 80 bips to, to a percent in fees per trade. Whereas again, I remember the mm. reason the reason why I went to Kraken first off was you were paying. I think back then you're still paying maybe thirty bips, but you know that's fifty mm. bips better. You know it doesn't mm. it doesn't take you long to do many trades, and you've made yeah you know, you've paid for all those swift fees and all that type of stuff. So sure. um, and the price was better. So you know, and I guess that's again that was the other thing we looked at. I looked at it and like, well, you know, we can offer to the Australian market a much more compelling fee proposition. Um, I think we can offer better liquidity, which, you know, at the moment we're certainly offering very, very competitive liquidity compared to probably better than IR in line with BTC markets. Um, our pricing's very good. Our, uh, we tend to actually just be cheaper than, yeah, than, than, than those guys. The, yeah, a ridiculous amount um, yeah. since we've kind of moved across. I mean, I used to use BTC markets myself. And then obviously when I got to, to know you, you know, started setting up and doing our, when we buy mining rigs, we always have to pay in, in BTC. Yeah. Um, so I started using mine digital, but the on-ramp that we've been able to save is is substantial. Mm. Um, and you know, I also, I think one of the main reasons that I've stuck with it is, you know, Australians usually are quite big on customer service and being able to have that, you know, grade A uh, customer service. Um, and there's been times, you know, when Bitcoin was crashing, we had a market capitulation recently. I think I messaged you at about 11 o'clock at night. Um, and so did I know a few of our community members um, and you were online there to, to take a deposit straight away, um, you know, cr- credit it into the account as long as we sent the bank transaction. Yeah. Uh, and it's just things like that that you just don't um, see, particularly from exchanges around the world, I find, you know, usually they're more just you, you use the interface, you send a, an email to support and you might hear back in 24 hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's the, you know, one of the major things I really love about Mind Digital and, and what the community is loving is that kind of personal relationship. Um, people have made recommendations on things that they, they would like to be changed and you've actioned those um, straight away. Um, so, yeah, that's a massive yeah. credit to you guys. I, I, so. I mean, thanks, Matt. And I think I think from that point of view, it's really got to do with both Matt and myself. So Matt's our, for those who don't know, Matt Starkey's our COO. Um, 
you know, very, very much we're, we're used to coming from a, a background on when you're dealing with institutional brokers on the other side, you expect mm. to be able to ring your broker, rain, hail, or shine. They'll know what orders you're working, what you've been filled on, what, you know, what else might be going on, what you were thinking of doing. Like, you know, if you just rung them and said, you know what, oh, you know, I think I think Aussie dollar is going to go higher here. So give me a ring if it rallies 30 pips and I'll have a look at the chart. You know, you, mm. you, you expect that's just sort of like, you know, the environment. That's that's relationship. Exactly. And that's the environment we've we've gotten used to in it. I know I mean we're we're cognizant obviously that's gonna be, you know, if we if we get gigantic, it's gonna be very hard oh. to maintain that entire level. But they, yeah, th- that's why, you know, at the moment we're wanting to work towards, you know, improving our you know, our community um, you know, communications through, you know, we just started up a, you know, telegram announcement group last week. We're trying to, you know, encourage as many people as follow, you know, possible. If you signed up to the exchange, you know, please follow us on Twitter. It's not because we want to send you freaking cat tweets or something like that. It's because we want to put, you know, <laughs> an announcements yeah. on there to, to inform you of what's going on to, you know, to give you updates and things like that. So, you know, it's one of, and, and, you know, I think ultimately as we've spoken about, Will, we really want to get to the part where, you know, we've got a, you know, in-house mind digital chat service of some type of form and you know yeah, and, of course. and we'll be monitoring that on a on an active basis and obviously been trying to you know help as many clients as possible um during that but yeah i think it's one of those things where we're very um you know keen to to be active in the community as much as possible as you said before like yeah also one of the things i, I really enjoy doing is going to do the you know the in-person events getting to meet different people i mean for a lot of people you know they've come into bitcoin because you know, by by the very definition of what it is, they've come into it via digital. So they've you know mm. maybe read something online. A friend maybe's recommended them something. They've maybe read a few forums and stuff like that. You know, for them, you know, to the ability to be able to turn up to an event and actually interact with other people and and you know see who's talking and what's being said and and things like that. I think it's it's a really valuable piece. That that you know we, we've still got a long way to go. I mean, it was a great it was a great mm. thing this morning. I was reading, you know, Mike Dundas, who's the editor in chief of the Block dot com, you know, which is a big crypto newsletter, and he was saying, you know, over the last three years, he reckons he's lost more Twitter followers from his classical tech friends than he than he's ever lost for in, in any other reason. And it's like mm. one of these things. Like you've still got Silicon Valley, you know, the guys who are the you know epitome of tech still really mm. aren't interested in bitcoin so if you're the if you're the average person on the street and you're actually trying to get your head around this i mean yeah there's there, it, you and i might say well there's a lot of information online and there is but obviously there's a lot of it's hard to fill to that whereas you yeah, know exactly. the, these meet and greets whether or not i'm involved in them or not doesn't much matter but meet and greets and things like that are still are still for a lot of people the the, the easiest way for them to get involved in the in the the space you know they can yeah. turn up and they're going to meet other people who have got the same issues you know they might not know what a hardware wallet is they might not understand the difference between a hot and a cold wallet they might not understand why is there an ethereum classic and there's an ethereum like all these things and you know and, th- and this is 100 percent and yeah, so- you, I think you really you nail it um, in terms of that idea that you know things that are online. You know, there's a, there's an abundance of resources online, um, but a lot of the time people don't realise a lot of it is really biased or trying to direct yeah. you into to one way. Um, and you know, to, to tap on the point that you said that you want to start the community side, you know, for mining store, that was the main reason that we started our community side to help people to give people that safe place that they can mm. actually get honest opinions from people not just at the time it was everyone saying oh you know bitcoin to the moon and it's like oh everyone was just buying it you know with no due diligence no understanding of the technology um but to have that kind of community on the back end that you can really ask and if, if it's going down people are going to say yeah it's it's going down for xyz reason not it's just going down yeah. um but yeah i mean communities and, and, and as i say getting getting in in, in face-to-face contact with people um, you know, is a, a massive side to it too. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's a as you said, mate. Like I've seen it first, you know, firsthand in your, you know, the the mining store Discord community. I mean, you know, a guy like Mad J, for example, like the the amount of, um, you know, the amount of effort and 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 wisdom and and tips he's given to the other people in the community. There, it's, it's super valuable. And and you know, it that's, is, yeah. and it and it might not be. He's not. It's not like he's telling you how you're going to make a bazillion percent, but like I remember a case like the other day we we're talking about. It was like something I think the euro had broken out, broken lower, and you know one of the other guys had gotten stuck in a pretty bad long, 
And he was sort mm-hmm. of like saying, you know, like, well, yeah, you just got to start cutting risk. You've got to now pick a new target where, you know, if it can bounce back to bounce back to like this level, that's now going to be resistance where you probably want to take off 50% of the position there and then you want to manage it this way and that way. Yeah. And, and again, yeah, it's as you said, it's not it's not it's not that someone's like you it's not like someone's there hand holding you because there's other times when obviously, you know, certain people are not going to be on in, you know, just live on on at that time, but as you said, it's 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 that that core takeaway is important to emphasize. As you said it's it's not biased. It's not it's not that exactly. you know it, he's not in there doing it to make a buck or or to exactly right. You know, yeah, you know he's he's not on the other side and it's going to influence or, or something like that. It's you know just genuine helping people, and it comes back around to him. Of course, you know we we take care of him. Um, you know anyone that's in the Discord will will get recommendations from others. Um, but yeah, it's really about finding that safe place. Yeah, I mean, as I think as you, you know, as we we're just talking about, you know, the the ability to be able to create a, a place for people to to ask questions, voice opinions. The other thing is, like, I think it's super important. I think it gets lost in a lot of this as well. Is like, you know, regardless of your level of experience in trading, it's it's always super useful to be able to have feedback from people, you know, and be able to reach out to someone else and, you know, throw up an idea. And if, if it, you know, funnily enough, it might be that everyone goes, that's a crazy idea doesn't mean it's actually not a bad idea. It actually sometimes, yeah. you know, could be the best idea. But, you know, that you, when you're though operating in a vacuum by yourself, it's sort of, you know, it's just very, very difficult to understand. You're not getting that real-time feedback, which, you know, obviously, again, if you're in a community where you know that there's, you know, people in there who are taking it seriously as well, they're offering, you know, legitimate opinions. It sort of just, you know, obviously makes it so much more valuable. That's it. I mean, too many times people refer back to indicators, you know, RSI or moving out averages but sometimes people are the, are the best indicators you know what i mean so being able to go okay this is all the research i've done put it into an open forum that's not biased and you're not going to get people you know acting in their in their own way um and then getting verification back even if it's yes it's good or no it's not um sometimes is the is the best due diligence there so i absolutely agree with that point um grant what we might do we will tie tie things back to uh custody um and insurance yep. uh, i know when uh, i first signed up to mind digital that was actually one of the things that really got me over the edge as a business owner um you know sometimes it's great that this is a decentralized place and you can keep things in a in a cold wallet and, and be really secure about it uh, but sometimes you need it on on the market ready to use and, and you need to have insurance or you need to have custody uh, a good custody provider. So, do you want to tap into a little bit about that um, yeah. and, and what it is that Grant and um, you and Mind Digital offer? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and you're exactly right. Well, so you know, my personal experience, I've still got. I think I've got four different ledgers, you know, hardware wallets that I still use from time to time for things. But I mean, quite honestly, it, it's the same as anything in the tech game, right? It's 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 caught up to now where you know, the, the digital custody solution. So our custody provider is a, is a company based out of Hong Kong called OSL. Um, they're currently going, they will be probably, well, definitely will be actually the first digital, licensed digital custodian in Hong Kong. Uh, the guys have been in the space for six years. Uh, some of them, they built some of the first wallets for Bitcoin um, and for Ethereum as well. Uh, the the hardware setup on their digital wallets is exceptional. It's in tier four data centers in, you know, literally oxygen. It's like James Bond level stuff. <laughs> Every, everything's in a Faraday cage. Um, none of them can get into the hot wallets. So recently, it's a really good example. So this is going to actually, I think it's a good way to to, to show you the level of, of, of access of how hard it is to access things. So we, we two weeks ago, we had a user um, so when you come onto my digital, right, you'll, you'll have a thing of where you'll have the, to, to put digital assets on or say, you know, you click on that and it'll give you an address to deposit yep. to. And then or vice versa, when you want to take it off, you're going to take it off to your own address. Now, what the user did is they sent it back. They didn't want to take it off exchange. They just changed their mind. And instead of generating a payment in address, they sent it, they just looked on the blockchain and sent it back to the, oh. the address it came from. That's a hot wallet. Right. That's a centrally mm-hmm. managed OSL hot wallet uh, with a custody provider, which is what they're doing. That's what we're paying them for. Um, mm. It took them two weeks to retrieve that Bitcoin. Now, the great news was for the user, it wasn't lost. Bitcoin mm. went up, so that's good. Um, <laughs> but it's not as simple as the user, like originally was a bit, uh, 
uh, you know, naturally so, was a bit skeptical. Like, oh, surely, surely you control all the wallets. You should be able to send it back. And like, no, you've sent it to the centralized hot wallet that supports the exchange. This is the most. Mm. This is the most secure part. Like, this is the most sorry vulnerable part of our entire setup. To access it is not just something we flippantly do. I can't just go mm. in there and start sending coins here, there, and everywhere. Look, the great, as I said, the great outcome of it was it all got signed off. But literally, the multi-sig process, and given the fact that no one's in the office together at the moment, like to get mm. the multi-sig process done for that to be access the hot wallet was yeah, it took two weeks, and it, and they literally sent over all the paperwork of where the CEO signed it, the CTO signed it. Their auditor, so they use PwC as an auditor in Hong Kong. The auditor has to sign off on the fact they're accessing the hot wallet. Like it's that level. Um, yeah, so their technology is very good. The, uh, their real big breakthrough is that they've really, really done lots and lots of work on being able to move coins essentially just straight from frozen storage, which is the mm. you know the the deep down dark underground vault into hot wallets. So essentially, it's why. You know, people can, so that's why they were able to access ins the insurance market. So the insurance market they have access is the Lloyds of London market out of, out of England. Um, yep. and so, and the reason why they did that, the reason why the insurers felt so comfortable working with OSL and granting them the policy was because of that. They could see their level of technology so high level, so advanced, and they, you know, done so much work on. So essentially users can know that when you come up, when you come to mine digital, for every for every one Bitcoin you put on exchange, for example, this is metaphorically, it's not your direct holdings, but 0.8 of that, 80% is always held in frozen storage. So mm. even if even if the hot wallet was was compromised, attacked, and emptied, you should you would have 80% of your holdings on exchange mm. will always be basically protected. That's really other, good. Yeah. The other twenty percent is covered by the insurance, and the the the, the policy that they that the OSL team have been able to take out is a very it's it's even more enhanced than the industry standard insurance policy because it covers one important thing: it actually covers employee theft. So you know, a good example, Cryptopia. I know, obviously, they yeah, didn't have say. yeah, obviously they didn't have insurance, but even if they did, they would have you know, because it was largely an employee internal employee issue that caused the hack, um, most insurance policies would say, well, they just wash their hands of that and go, no, that's yeah. not us. So um, that, that's that's the comfort factor. So, you know, from our point of view, I, I you know, it's one of the things I really want, you know, users to understand. If you put digital assets, if you put your Bitcoin, your, your ETH, your crypto on mine digital, it is like, is so highly protected it's so highly cared for that, you know, as you said, I, I personally, you know, obviously now I keep, uh, the only things I keep on hardware wallets are, are literally altcoins that I get from, you know, airdrops and things like that that just automatically drop into those ledger accounts. But now sure. I keep I keep all my all my crypto on there. Um, we have we have a professional fund who keeps their crypto on mine digital for exactly the reasons you said, Will, you know, if they need to trade, they need to trade so you know mm. but they're, they're comforted by the fact that they know there's a, a very you know top tier you know i, I would sell legitimately are probably a top three global custodian these days they're, they're definitely up there you know comparable to bitgo um and and the insurance on top of it gives you that extra peace of mind and 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 again to be really blunt to uh, the other great thing is is we're 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 taking that cost on so we're not passing that through to users, you know, whereas other mm. exchanges, IR, for example, independent reserve, that's if you want that level of service and that level of comfort, you have to pay them for it. Whereas we're, we're yeah, you know, exactly. as a business, we've decided that that's a, that's a necessary thing for us to operate in this space to offer offer that to, to users. So, yeah, I think, I think it's something that definitely differentiates us in the Australian space. 100% and you probably got like almost don't get enough credit for that because one of the main things that this space needs is ease of entry and you know it's great for some people that know how to use a Trezor and, and it's easy for them but a lot of people you know it's it's complicated even turning a computer on you know and yeah. being able to you know just like the banking system um, send funds to a place know that they're in a safe place know that there's insurance know that there's customer service just like you said if if someone did send it to the wrong wrong wallet and and you did own it that yes it was a long process but that's mm. for the good of their own security yeah um and, and to you know have that trust in in, in someone or, or or an entity so um yeah really good stuff um by mine digital there 
Yeah. Um, I, 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 just quickly on that one as well, mate, just to, just to, before we move off on that, and also um, just to all of our Australian dollar bank accounts and US dollar bank accounts are covered by Australian deposit taking institutions. So, you know, they, they're banks with full, um, you know, in, uh, deposit insurance. And then the one offshore bank we use is, is denominated is out of New York um, state again, fully deposit, you know, covered by the the Fed over there as well. So, you know, on the fiat side as well, we we we're very careful on segregating client funds away from operational funds. So, you know, we can always make you know withdrawals, deposits, and things like that for users. But also, yeah, you, they they should know that we're not using some third tier credit union type solution for a bank mm. account. Yeah, they're proper, fully regulated APRA Australian banks. Yeah, and credit to you because no doubt it's costly on your end. You know, there's things that you know you could have done done in a quicker way, and it, it ultimately that just leads to demise. Though, like Cryptopia, um, you know, completely going bust and everything that happened there. Yeah. Um, it's really good to see you guys. You know, not not trying to cut cut corners, um, and just get this to be the the best thing for for the future. So, um, great stuff there. Um, now. Obviously, yeah, the, we had our mining store and mine digital meetup in Melbourne, which was which is really awesome. To, yeah. As you said, that face to face interaction. I think we all had a, a really good night, and it was a, a, a quite a large turnout as well. Yeah, it was great. Uh, so, yeah, it's had, had some people that I'd never met before coming through, and and some people that we've interacted with over um, the mining store Discord over the past few years. So that was really great. Now, one of the things that we um, briefly uh, touched on there was uh, this kind of loan um, products that we're get, we're going to be um, bringing out. Um, yep. Do you want to just touch on, on on that a bit? I mean, I know people in our mining store community, um, some of them buy two or three Bitcoin and they, they really just want to hold it for five years, um, but they're not used to not receiving a dividend of some sort on on, on their assets. So um, do you want to bit, touch a bit on the, the, the loan products that are coming? Yeah. Um, and um, are they accessible right now, I suppose, on the back end? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um so we're, we're, I guess we're offering really two two broad broad very set uh, very broad uh, products. So one, as you said, will is 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 what we're calling essentially is more akin to a, a term deposit product. So in that in that you know way you would you would deposit your Ethereum, your Bitcoin. Um, so at the moment on Bitcoin, we'll pay you six percent um, every twelve months. On your Ethereum, we'll pay you four and a half percent. If you want to lock up Tether, we'll pay up to eight and a half percent on on Tethers. At the moment, and and there'll be you know like every term deposit, you can do three months, six months, twelve months. Um, those coins go to a insured you know cust- insured custodial wallet. So again, you have all the same protections there. Um, yeah, so we, we think you know for for some users that's definitely um, should be an attractive option for them, as you said, especially if you know that you know yeah you, know, you might say to yourself, well, okay, I own X Bitcoin. 20% I want to hold until, you know, you've got some kids or whatever I want to hold until they all turn 18 and then I'm going to give them to them. So, yeah, I'm going to keep yeah. those for, as you said, 5, 10, 15 years. So, yeah, if you're going to earn deposit, if you're going to earn an interest rate on it, that's great. Um, to be completely transparent, people ask, well, what, how can we afford to pay for that? So essentially what we can do is without having to move the coin, so the coin can sit in the wallet, um, we have liquidity providers who will give us virtual um, credit for that on their exchange. Mm-hmm. So, so they will say that. So, I want to make it clear to users that that they, their coins are never being used as 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 a, are never leaving the wallet, and and there's no mm-hmm. concern for them that there's any that 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 any of these other people ever have any claim on those coins. Um, it's it's more from a point of view from us. It just makes us look like a a, a, a much better balance sheet and a you know stronger exchange to to those providers and and they they they're normally sending credit to us in the traditional fiat market um, rather than in a in a crypto market. So the volatility is not an issue there. It's more it's more that we're borrowing um, US dollars from them in the short term market. Um, and For then sure. and then the other yeah and the other the other longer term uh, the other product that we're doing. Uh, as you said, is crypto back loan. So that's your traditional um, concept of where you put up some collateral. In this case, whether, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum at the moment, we're happy to take obviously stable coins, but you know, that's really just, that's just really, you just might as well liquidate that and spend the money. And, and, and the beauty of that is, is, is it's allowing the users really to go off and use the proceeds of the loan for whatever they please. Um, you mm. know, from, from our point of view, it's not like, um, you having to go to your local bank and taking out a personal loan and they're going, well, what are you using it for? We want to see, you know, evidence of where it goes. In this case, essentially, the user comes in, um, we're, we're, we're doing, you know, 
up to up to 50 60 percent lvr so if you put in uh, one dollar of bitcoin um you can get up to 60 cents back in a loan uh the interest rates are very competitive um and essentially really at the moment they're, they're mostly either 12 months or 24 months um we, we can do longer uh, to be honest doing longer is, is more a question i guess it's, it's probably more from the user's point of view um where, where it probably doesn't work as well um but you know the 12 month, I think, has been the sweet spot from what we've, you know, the market research we've done on the other providers in this space. It seems to be where people want to use and it, and it gives you access to, it gives you access to, to immediate cash. So, i.e., good example at the moment is, you know, you, when Bitcoin recently fell, obviously you want to still hold those Bitcoins, but you might want to go and buy some more, but you don't want to buy it on a leveraged exchange, you know, where you can technically get liquidated. So, mm-hmm. okay, you want to come in. You know, you put up your, your your Bitcoin and you get take a loan out and you purchase those Bitcoins and you and you and you service the loan and then if Bitcoin recovers, you can either sell portion of that stack to pay the loan mm-hmm. off, which is obviously mm-hmm. a terrific case, or you you know you service out of your normal income and and you know Bob's your uncle on that side. So um, and yeah. then obviously you always maintain the economic upside to the Bitcoin, so or, or, or Ethereum. But yeah, so we we, we think um, to answer your question, Will. At the moment, we, we, we are, we are, it is, it is available. So literally, I've got to do a call this afternoon with probably the, the person will be our first customer um, in this yep. aspect. And I don't want to yep. talk on it too much as well, but um, obviously do your own research. But there is potentially some tax advantages of using the loan um, mechanism as well. So if you're personally, I use, I book all my trading activity on the revenue account. So if yep. I make money, I have to pay the personal tax rate. But if I lose money, I can claim it directly as less taxable income. But if you if you account for your holdings and you're trading on the capital account, um, because it's a loan, you're not actually locking in a, a liquidated price. So from that point of view, it's not a capital um, CGT event, which obviously can have some um, advantages too, which obviously, you know, go see your tax agent for, for that full right, advice. Yeah. But you know, it definitely, it definitely can be advantageous for people from that point of view as well. Hundred percent, and I think you know one of the they're, they're unbelievable products. I mean, I haven't seen anyone else really offering them, or anyone that I would trust to engage with that, that are offering them. So, I mean, that's a great thing. But I think it's just having the option there. Like, it's not something that is right for everyone. Yeah, um, but, absolutely. You know, there are- there are scenarios there where oh, that is really, really beneficial to me and it might not be right for someone else, but for that person, it really is. So um, I know personally I'll, I'll be engaging in, in the loan side um, and, um, yeah, I encourage people that, you know, to consider the options not to jump into it. Oh, I need to take advantage of that, but there will be a time that oh, that, that could really help them. So um, that's a really awesome thing that, that's coming out there, Grant. Yeah. Um, look, I think we'll probably tie things up there, mate. You and I, we could uh, <laughs> talk for, for hours and hours that's, and hours. That's for sure, um, mate. That's for sure. Luckily, people have a bit of time on their, their hands to, to listen to these things at the moment. But yep. uh Mate, um, yeah, awesome to have a chat and really, really looking forward to, to future engagement. Um, just want to say again, love your input in, in the Mining Store um, Discord and, and having the team in there um, and everyone in the Mining Store Discord really loves it as well. Um, yeah, I, I can't say enough how, how important it is just to have that customer experience if, if they want to put money in or, um, you know, if there is a, a slight issue or they don't understand something, being able to speak to the CEO or being able to speak to your, your team members yeah. um, is, is invaluable. So. Yeah. Uh, mate, really looking forward to, to things to come. Um, thanks for coming on today and, um, yeah, all the best, mate. Mate, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. All right, take care, mate. Cheers, Bob. See you, mate. Bye. Bye.